Langchain enables people to uh, import a class and to query uh, OpenAI, for instance, in like, essentially one line of code, which I think is, is incredible. Langchain is, I guess, first and foremost, it's an ecosystem. It's not really a tool. It's, I find it really, it's really interesting, actually. They've standardized a collection of words, which now people can use to talk about these models. So things like retrievers, loaders, LLMs, and they've created these composable classes, which work very similarly to like an SDK. Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless, a podcast where I speak with real world practitioners and get their stories from the changes. Today, I'm joined by Matt Carey, who is a senior engineer at Alios, a cloud native um, consultancy that focuses on AWS and the serverless. And uh, Matt has been working a lot on the generative AI and has built some really cracking tools recently. So I'm really glad to have him on here to talk about the stuff he's been working on. So welcome to the show, Matt. Hi. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Um, yeah, no, it's great to be on this podcast and uh, been admiring of Jans for a long time. So it's awesome to come out and chat here. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your work with uh, Alios and uh, how you're going into this whole generative AI stuff that you've, you've been working on. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, I'm a developer at Alios. Um, Alios, as Jan says, we're a cloud native consultancy based out in London. And we're part of a wider group called the Theoda Group. Um, I do a lot of work with generative AI and specifically with open source. Um, I'm the creator of, uh, I'm the creator of a toolbox that we're calling Orion Tools. It's like an open source toolkit, which empowers developers uh, with tools to make the best out of JT AI. I'm also a core contributor of Quiver, which has sort of 20,000 stars on GitHub. And is like sort of the thing that started off this whole uh, uh, adventure into the world of JT AI. Yep, I will put the, those links in the description below. So if you want to check them out yourself, uh, so you can always go and do that. So with uh, Quiver um, and uh, some of the other things you've been working on, you've spent a lot of time with Langchain development. Um, so for people who hasn't really used it before or haven't heard about it before, can you just uh, give us a quick introduction? Uh, what is Langchain, how it works, and how does it fit into the picture of uh, you know, what you would do to develop AI applications on top of uh, those uh, large language models uh, these days? Of course. Um, yeah. Uh, so Langchain, I just, well, before, we can just, we can just step a step back to be fair. Langchain, like how, how could one get into Genesis AI before they touch like, on Langchain, I think is almost like slightly more interesting. If you want me to go into that? Um, before yeah, touching yeah, on absolutely. Go for it. Um, Like, so, I really discovered it from like a sort of use case point of view. So, um, which is, I guess, the best way to discover something. So I was asking some questions. So my boss, Ben, was asking some questions to me about a little known service in AWS called AWS Forecast. And it's a service for time series forecasting. I had to read like a bunch of like super long white papers about it. And there was like a huge case study. And we were just trying to work out whether we could do something for a client using this service. And I didn't have very long. It was a lot of reading and a lot of like technical um, jargon, a lot of stuff I'd have to look up. Uh, and I always had this like interest in generative AI. Um, I was a beta tester back in the day, like for GPT-2. And I thought it was like absolutely mind blowing when it came out, it was incredible. And I knew about some projects that could load these like huge documents into, and they used Langchain, which we'll come on to later. Um, and they would use like these large language models, these huge AI models to answer questions over your documents. And that's pretty cool when you've got like five documents that are sort of 10,000 words each and they're like full of equations and stuff and like stuff that you'd really have to look into quite deeply. Uh, but I only need a very surface overview. Um, and it would have been really nice if it could have like sprouted its sources as well, which was helpful. And I knew, I knew there were a few of these projects out there. And so I did a bit of Googling and one of the main ones is a, a chatbot style one built by a guy called Mayo Ocean. Uh, he also um, has some like contributors from Langchain. So a guy called Jacob, Jacob Lee has done a lot of work on that project as well. And like I, I tried this tool and it was super easy to use. I cloned the repo and I was like, wow, this is insane. Like, like I've just done the work of sort of like five people in 20 minutes. And it was it was incredible. It was like it was like it was like that was my light bulb moment that this stuff is really really useful for documentation retrieval and information retrieval. And then about the same time, a friend uh, like Stan Giard, who works for a sister company of Alios in France, um, they're called uh, Theodore France. He made a project called Quiver, which I talked about slightly before. Um, but they aim to like build upon the work of Mayo, and they're building like the, your virtual second brain. 
and they're building and improving the UX, they're making this a really cool tool. Um, and then sort of like, I was like trying to get involved with Quiver, like like help stand out, like try and learn about how it all works and like how do you actually use LLMs. Um, and that was game really cool. We got quite into Langchain. We'll talk about in a second about what exactly that is. Um, and then we just like with Quiver, we discovered there was a whole like UX problem with LLMs. And then while other people, I don't really do much front end, they were focusing on the UX. I was like, wow, there's like a huge like tooling problem. Like we're using Langchain. It's an alpha package. We uh, like there's like there's like not much maturity into this stuff. And we could see a bunch of pain points with development. So I then went a little bit of my own way and started Orion Tools. Um, and that includes a project we're going to talk about in a bit, hopefully, which is uh, Code of GPT, which went a bit viral a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, so, it looks great, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It's been really good fun to make. It's like, uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of people on board and we're up to nine contributors. Um, and we're using Langchain for JavaScript, which is different to uh, Langchain for Python. So, yeah, most of the fun. other Langchain examples I've seen before, I think uh, from um, uh, Shane Wong, for example, he did a small developer uh, that's based on Python and his uh, you know, implementation is actually surprisingly small. I looked at the Python code, it's only like 40, 50 lines of code or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Incredible and, uh, what you could make. Like yeah. Langchain's like really, they've really empowered people. So I guess like we could talk a little bit about what Langchain is. I think it's like probably the foremost tool in the in the space. Absolutely, and uh, that's uh, that, I think that's something that uh, I'm quite interested in myself. Uh, uh, yeah. How much you can you know get done with uh, so little lines of code, uh, and how does the land chain you know actually work, and how it fits into with other like ChatGPT or other LLM uh, models out there? Um. So, land chain is, I guess, first and foremost, it's an ecosystem. It's not really a tool. It's I find it really it's really interesting actually. So. What these guys did in Langchain, and they're super nice guys like Harrison and you know, and what they did was they um they've standardized a collection of words which now people can use to talk about these models. So things like retrievers, things like vector stores, things like um well, vector stores kind of established, but like especially things like retrievers, like loaders, LLMs, and they've created these like classes, like composable classes, which work very similarly to like an SDK to interact with third parties. So for instance, say you want to use AWS Bedrock, you instantiate the Langchain class that uses Bedrock, and you already have like a composable piece that then say you want to switch it out for like an open source model, you could use the Hugging Face Hub class. And there's like, you can like switch through all these things relatively straightforwardly. They're, they're fighting this huge battle because none of these pieces were made to fit together, but they've done a, like incredible work in making these classes fit together. And, um, yeah, like the documentation is getting much better. Um, it, Langchain enables people to write, um, to uh, import a class and to query uh, OpenAI, for instance, in like, essentially one line of code, um, which I think is is incredible. Um, it's really mad. And yeah, like they're already on what, 50, 58,000 stars on GitHub. And I think they're going to do really, really, really well. Um, does, that, you... does that answer? And explain what it is enough or uh, i guess or... Uh, on a high level uh but i guess in that case uh so you're someone who hasn't who's not familiar with a lot of those words you mentioned just now in terms of retrievers and things like that um, how does it um i guess uh, uh for, for layman like myself can you explain how does the land chain work in terms of the bits that connect uh, so I'm kind of roughly understand that and uh, uh, understand that uh, you know as part of land chains of uh, automation, it takes uh, your query, uh, it uh, applies uh, it, it applies into like a template that you use uh, to query the LLM, and then uh, it's able to go to a vector store or some kind of document store to find data that you want to be inserted into the context of the current conversation. Um, so there's uh, there's some placeholders in your template that you insert documents and things like that. Uh, but then um, your example, uh, you know, if you've got a really large uh, document uh, that's, you know, if you inject it into the, 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 the into the actual one um, uh, one question to uh, the open or well, to um, ChatGPT, for instance, it's going to exceed the context window. I know they're doing some clever things to sort of segment the questions out. Um, so can you maybe talk us through the the process in which uh, land chain kind of uh, you know takes bits of uh, control here, you know, uh, combine some things there. So how does that uh, fit together? 
Yeah, of course. So what Langchain is aiming to do is they're providing these composable pieces. Um, so they're providing like an LLM class, which you used to call an LLM. They're providing a vector store class, which you used to query the vector store and check how close embeddings are, do similarity searches on pieces of documentation. But then what really is really powerful is then they've created these, um, they've created chains essentially. Uh, and this is like, this is like a word that I wasn't super familiar with before I started getting into this, but this is what Langchain is really about. It's about chaining together individual pieces to then um, create something that actually fulfills a function. So yes, you can query an LLM like ChatGPT and go ask um, like, what is the answer to this based on its training data? And if it knows the answer, awesome. If it doesn't know the answer, you're out of luck. So what can you do? Well, you wanna give it, there's like a few options. Uh, the easiest one is you wanna supply all the information in the prompt. So things like Claude 100K, you can supply like, like half a book essentially in a prompt and then you ask the question underneath. So that would be like an LLM chain. They, that would like, be like their like basic chain. Um, and you would just substitute in your question into the bottom of the prompt, into the string, and then send it all to the LLM, get it back, and that would be your answer. The second way, which is what most of these things use, and that's what, what Langchain uses in their retrieval chain, if you've seen any documentation about the retrieval chain, is it's, it's a little bit uh, more involved. So you have this idea of an embeddings model. So there are kind of two types of natural language models. There's an L, there's the uh, like completions model, which you give it a some text and it completes the sentence. That's like what ChatGPT uses, um, what people are very familiar with, like a chatbot um, would use. It would like, you, it, it would have a system prompt under the hood that says, uh, you are a chatbot. Here is a, uh, you answer things truthfully. Here is a question from the user, um, start your answer here and finish, and then finish, then it will just finish that sentence. But an embeddings model, what it does is it takes your text and it puts it in a 3D, well, it's actually way more than 3D, it's like 1,500 something or other uh, dimensions, if you're talking about OpenAI, uh, vector space. So this takes the meaning of your text, semantic meaning, and puts it into a vector space. And what you can do now is your meaning is associated to that to those uh, the, the, those dimensions and then you can take another vector and you can look at the difference in like um like the difference how far away those two vectors are like literally the distance between them and if there's something called like a euclidean distance and that that distance will be how close those two chunks of text are in meaning so what you can do is you can have this huge documentation, like thousands and thousands and thousands of lines. And if you vectorize them all, if you get embeddings for them all, you'll have lots of different points in vector space. Then you get a question from the user, say, um, like, um, so say it's a book about, about dogs, right? Um, and the question from the user is, what uh, dog or what breed of dogs are in this book? Then that question, you get an embedding of that question so you're talking about dogs, you're talking about breeds. Um, then in the, um, then you do a vector search, like a similarity search between those two vectors, between the vectors of the, like the body of information, like all those individual vectors and the vector of the question, the chunk of the question. And then you do a similarity search between those two. You find the closest vectors, which will be the ones that contain the answer. You combine those pieces of information together. You send that to an LLM and say, given this context, um, uh, then these like little, then these like chunks of text answer this question. And then you hope that those, that context will contain that answer. So you're doing, you're basically removing all of the stuff you don't need. And you're just, uh, you're just taking in what hope, something that you hope will have the answer to the question. In. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we are, I actually spoke with uh, Randall Hunt uh, in the last episode, and he also mentioned the uh, embeddings, the models as well. Um, I guess uh, in, in my mind, there's still some sort of uh, confusion because uh, with ChatGPT, uh, you also have a plugins. Uh, plugins, uh, some of them allows you to uh, answer questions or sorry, um, ask questions of your PDFs, uh, for example, so you can provide a URL to a PDF file and, and you can say essentially, uh, read this PDF um, and just you know, tell me, you know, give me a summary or um, what does this uh, uh, section mean? I don't understand uh, um, things like that. So I guess that that's more of the LM chain that you mentioned where potentially they can read the PDF, extract uh, the text, 
insert that into the context so that the, when you ask the question, it becomes a much bigger text that is sent to the chat GPT model. Whereas what you're talking about is that you are building a vector space and supplementing it with the vector space that's used to train the underlying model, the foundational model, and then you can then create, not necessarily creating a new model, but you're creating like a more temporary um, model. Um, or, or is that the still yeah, the same no, model? So but the, go on. It's still the same model. So there is like, there's like actually two distinctions. There is also, so with my, with the retrieval chain, for instance, your, all your, all your, you're planning on doing is getting relevant pieces of context from the model that's the only point uh, from the from the documentation or from your context you need small relevant pieces that hopefully are going to answer your question that's the only need for the for the embeddings um what you're kind of talking about is one step further which is sort of the third and hardest step which is what people are uh, focusing on now so i'm doing a little bit of work with this now which is fine tuning so here you essentially retrain the model to a small degree you actually adjust the internal weights of the uh, of the large language model and you um you include new training data so this is fine tuning so this is uh this is like one step further it's like one step harder and generally you'll start with the easiest way like adding um just adding the context to the model then you will go to an embedding search to add the context to the model. And then if you have too much documentation or it's very too specific, then you will look at fine tuning your own model. And that's sort of the progression that you can go through. Right. And that's where PEFT uh, and uh, problems like overtraining becomes uh, something that you've got to think about. Uh, and uh, well, I guess uh, retraining a whole model with additional data efficiently. I guess that's where the PEFT uh, uh, comes yeah. from. Okay. You just say the and embedding people, model, uh, I wasn't, it's gone. Sorry. I just uh, interrupted you. Oh, no, no, no. Go for it. No, go for it, go for it, go for it. I guess the embedding model, I guess that's the, the bit where I wasn't quite sure. I guess in that case, you still got your fund uh, foundational model hasn't changed, but the model is built such a way that it allows you to, at the time of asking a question, provide additional context. Um, that's mm. not as part of the question. Is that the difference between that versus uh, what you would do with a chat GPT and a PDF uh, plugin? Yeah, so uh, pretty much, yes. So the embeddings model, uh, you can think about it as a completely separate model. So OpenAI release completions models. They also release embeddings models. Ah, and okay. you would use, so the chain is actually multiple different pieces. So the first thing will be um, you ask a question and that question will uh, like be sent to the embeddings model. You'll get a vector search um, to that of your documentation. You'll extract the relevant, this is the, um, the retriever, will extract the relevant pieces um, in the documentation. And then that will be added to your prompt that will be sent to an LLM. That LLM will answer the question. So there's like multiple stages on this process and you can add and adapt these stages to be more or less efficient. Um, and that's where the sort of chain comes in. Uh, so that that is different from fine tuning where all the work is done. You can think of it as work done um, on build time or, or like deploy time and work done at runtime. So with change, you have much more work done at runtime. With fine tuning, you have much more work done at build time. Right, gotcha. And uh, from what I discussed with um, Rendo in the last episode, uh, he also mentioned that uh, for certain, I guess, uh, specialized inter industries like medicines and uh, uh, law, potentially, where you know you have to work with a large base of uh, knowledge that's not maybe in the general purpose uh, chat GPT model. So that's where fine tuning comes in. But then for specific, I guess in your case, uh, for specific uh, organizations that's got uh, institutional knowledge that need to be applied on top of the, the more specialized model, you can then use the fine tuned model combined with uh, embedding so that you can then uh, say, okay, based on the, um, uh, based on the, the diagnosis for this patient uh, and uh, the, the existing body of uh, medical knowledge that we have in the fine-tuned model, you know, tell me about, uh, I don't know, the patient's uh, prognosis and things yeah. like that. I guess that's kind of the yeah. use case you can have, right? Exactly, yeah. The way I'm thinking about it with uh, Code of GPT is that um, the code in the file wants to be included in the context, like the direct context of the prompt. That's number one. Code in other files wants to be included in a, an embedding search and added to context. That's number two. It's like three layers of abstraction. And then number three, um, fine tuning, is if you're using a framework that's new, that's very new, like maybe React Native or Next.js 13, which has an app router, um, OpenAI hasn't, hasn't trained their models or even like some of the newer models, they're not trained, they have a cutoff window. And so this, I need to extend the cutoff window. So here, that's when I'm like involving fine tuning. 
that's a really great point because all the all the coding stuff uh, is all stuck in 2021. So the fact that it's missed uh, two years, uh, that's maybe like about 10, 15 different JavaScript frameworks in that time. It's a huge difference when it comes to something like Next. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Okay, um, so you just mentioned the code review GPT. Uh, so I think that's is a good uh, segue for us to uh, hand it over to you and uh, you know show us uh, what the Quiver and the code review GPT can do. Because yeah. uh, I've yeah, tried it myself, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening who haven't, and uh, they would love to see what you can do with the Quiver and the code review GPT. Awesome. Should we start with Quiver or code review? Uh, let's do a Quiver. Uh, uh, qu uh, let's do a Quiver. Uh, I think that's a quite quiver. easy one yeah, to, do, to, to uh, show it. off. Um, yeah, it's really good fun. Right, I'll just share my screen. So can you see my screen? How's this? Yep, I can see it nice and clear. Cool, I'm trying to move this stuff. There we go. I'll put you down there. Nice, right, so quiver, 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 quiver. Right, there we go. Cool. Um, so for guys who are just listening on the uh, Spotify, so Matt is uh, going to show us uh, um, the uh, Quiver that he talked about earlier, which you can check out at the Quiver.app, or you can go to YouTube and uh, watch the video. The link is in the description below. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll try and talk through as I'm going forward. I didn't realize we had Spotify people. Okay, cool. So Quiver is, the idea of Quiver is it's your second brain in the cloud. Um designed to easily uh, store, retrieve unstructured information. So is that like seminal use case of generative AI, that use case that like brought me to generative AI where I was like, wow, it's really good for searching over like a crazy amount of documentation. Like it's just really, really, really good for this. So um, Quiver is an open source app. So we run a hosted version for anyone to use, uh, but you can also host it yourself. You can check out the GitHub. It's very easy to host yourself. It's like two containers. Um, and you can push those to AWS e uh, ECS or however you want to do it. This is actually run on Fargate currently. So, um, right, let's get started. Let's have a go. So if you first get started, you'll end up, you can sign in uh, and you'll end up with this like little upload screen. Um, and what we're going to do with Quiver actually is we've given it the functionality, which is might be, uh, might be unwise, but it works quite well, is uh, to crawl websites. So what we could do here is we put in a website URL, um, I'm going to use the Alios About Us page um, and just check I've got a brain selected. Yeah, perfect. We're going to put in this website URL. It's going to crawl the website. It's going to extract all of the HTML and hopefully enough of the text. Um, and then we can ask questions to it. And all of this is going to be stored in my vector database, which um, in this case, we call them brains. And this is uh, we're using the Alios brain, so a brain that I created earlier. So in this case, so uh, what we... is a brain? Is it a, is a brain just a collection of the documents or information that you've uh, crawled or uploaded? Yeah, so it's, it's a body of information, and that's that's all it is. I don't know if you can see the green light here, but we've, okay, we've yeah, done yeah, a good it's been job. uploaded. Cool. So now we can chat, um, and so we can be something like. Well, we just check it works. Let's just let's just check it works. Um, we're changing models like a lot of the time, and um, so the hosted the hosted version is sometimes a little bit slow. And also I think the US will have just woken up. So this normally uh, this normally influences whether anything works. Okay, cool, it works, but it works very slowly. Yeah, the US has just woken up. Um, right. <laughs> Getting too but popular. Is, uh, yeah, I just wanna like uh, preface this with, this is the hosted version, this is free to use. Anyone can jump on it. If you wanna host it yourself, you'll get way better performance, like sort of, like 150 to 200 millisecond time to first byte, which is like so much better than what we just got there. Um, cool. So, uh, so like, um, what do you know about? So hopefully it knows quite a lot because we just pulled the whole about our us page and we uploaded it into its brain. Cool. So. It's not doing a wonderful job at paraphrasing, but it has retrieved a very like useful set of information about what it knows. Um, maybe we can ask it something a little bit off piece. I'm not entirely sure what's on this web page. What about um, uh, uh, give us some su uh, success stories uh, of Alios? Because you've got some case studies on your website. Maybe they uh, maybe you can find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So we um, if we upload the homepage and we just like go a bit to town, um, we can upload some case studies. Uh, Okay, come on, let's let's do it. Let's uh do 
this is like proper demo effective. This doesn't work because, <laughs> well, I, I am, I'm tempting fate here, aren't I? Right, let's try and work out this uh, capture. Is that one? That one's got a car. They've both got cars. Cool. Yeah, I'm properly tempting fate here. I haven't tried this. Uh, cool. So we download a case study. Um, download, save that. Okay. So you've uh, just downloaded a PDF uh, for a case study you guys did uh, with the client. So now you can yeah. upload it. So now we can upload it. We'll see, it might be too big for the free version, but we'll have a go. I think it's a 6.91 meg, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's going to be very close. I think we allow seven megabytes. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> but it hasn't said no yet. So, so I guess the, the file is, is, is that uploaded to S3 first uh, before you got the, uh, I guess, the file gate task that pick it up and then the, uh, feed it into the system? Yeah. So, Quiver was uh, built very, very quickly originally. So the original creator of Quiver, he was very involved with Superbase. So, oh, awesome. So this file will actually just be uploaded to Superbase. The whole okay. file will actually not be uploaded. So we take the file, we get embedding chunks of the file. Uh, we get chunks of the file, we upload the chunks. And while we're uploading the chunks, we're getting embeddings of those chunks that we then upload as well. So we never upload the whole file like together. Um, it's only the embeddings and the chunks. Okay, so I guess that's kind of important uh, from the from from I guess like the privacy protection point of view as well, right? That you don't store those uh, files that people upload. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And like your, the chunks will be uh, will be stored, but we can always go to explore here. We can see our data and we can just remove it as easily as this. Okay, gotcha. Um, so I guess now we can like ask a... uh, questions about uh, the case study, maybe some specifics yeah, that. Uh, yeah. um, so what do um, Alios provide? So building with Gentile is really interesting because like, oh, okay, we're still getting the same thing from the, the previously. Um, what do you know about serverless? And aviation? Pretty sure it's an aviation. Cool, okay. So these are some of the ways that serverless can benefit airlines. Um, and these have come straight from our case study. And the case study is sort of three pages long, so. Okay. Right, and uh, I guess uh, the only way you, you get this is, is, is through the, the document that you uploaded, but not as part of the yep. base model. Yes. Oh so yeah, because uh, it cites uh, studies by IDC as uh, the sixty percent reduction in, and thirty uh, three percent. Okay, yeah. So I guess that would be so coming. That would have come from the the PDF. Yeah. So this whole thing probably will have come from the PDF, but it won't have come word for word from the PDF. There's nothing in the PDF that says uh, specifically about serverless and aviation. It will all be talking about how we can help um, empower aviation. So what it does is it's gone through the document, it's worked out the little pieces that are important, and then it's rephrased it into its own words in its own set of key points. So it's very powerful usage, um, especially when you get to much longer documents. Uh, I'm not entirely, too fair, this might be quite long. I'm not entirely sure how long this is. Ah, it's only, oh no, it's huge. <laughs> okay, so it is 30 pages. So it it's has pretty long. Article, yeah. but I guess it doesn't have those exact things that uh, you just uh, listed there. At least I didn't see yeah. a nice uh, bullet point uh, with five things. So I guess this is the way it's combined uh, both information in the base model as well as the document that you've uploaded. Can you tell me more about how Alios? How uh, serverless helps with cost. Okay. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what it says. Cost per use, reduce infrastructure management, lower operational cost, increase the of productivity. Those are pretty good answers. <laughs> not bad, is it? It's not bad. Yeah, so Quiver's, Quiver's like really, really cool. And we have a new uh, version of the UI that's gonna come out sometime soon. Um, the front end developers are really awesome. Oh, no, no, let's just, I don't know if I have access to it on the global internet. Oh, yeah, but it's behind a feature flag. Um, so we we're like bringing in this thing where we can like at our brains. So 
you can ask questions in this sort of way, which is kind of interesting. I think it's better from a UX point of view. Um, people are quite used to replying like on GitHub or even like on Instagram or something. You right. reply like by asking someone. So if you just at your brain, you can add extra knowledge like this. Um, uh, you can create custom prompts as well, which is kind of interesting maybe from uh, people wanting to get a little bit more into, I'll, I'll just show that off now. It's, I think it's in here. So this is my Alios brain. It's running off GPT 3.5 Turbo, which we give out free to everyone. Um, so you can go onto Quiver and like mess around your heart's content with 3.5 Turbo. Uh, and we bear the brunt of the cost for that. So you can add um, extra prompts. So you can be like, um, write in Chinese and it probably will do it. I haven't actually tried the specific prompt. You can do things like um, uh, write uh, in the style of a pirate. Um, which might be easier because sometimes it's said that sometimes our prompt engineering under the hood, it will say something like uh, write in the same language as the prompt. So we might actually be like, if I wrote this in Chinese, uh, write in Chinese, it might work, but I don't know. So maybe like- well, I can uh, read it. <laughs> but I guess in this case, uh, it is uh, similar to the new um, preferences thing that the chat GPT had just released as well that you can, uh, so if I guess, um, yeah. okay. Oh no, that's not delete brain. Um, so I actually can't see any of the save buttons because they're underneath this my screen sharing. Well, I oh know that should be good. I don't know if this V two is like fully operational yet, but we can have a go. Yeah, no, that's not fully operational, but that's the plan, um, and that will be around in sort of um, a week or so, it's in the roadmap that you can just add custom prompts and um, it should preface that properly. I don't, just don't think I have permissions yet to enable that feature flag. Cool, okay. um, I can That's, show you code. Yeah, yeah let's, uh, let's let's do that. Um, so I guess the, if you're, listen, you're, you're listening to this podcast now, uh, this was recorded on the 14th of August. So by the time you listen to this or watching this video, there's a good chance that it's already been out. So please go ahead and try it out. It looks uh, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you're going to go ahead and show us the code review GPT. So please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you haven't already, go and have a look at uh, Quiver on GitHub. Uh, we're almost hitting 20,000 stars, which is really, really, really cool. Um, yeah, very, very excited. And you can see like we're adding stuff every day. I added three hours ago. Um, there are sort of three backend, three devs working on this. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's a really, really cool project made by uh, a friend of ours, Stan. Um, so yeah, it's very, very cool. Um, right, let's go code review GPT. So this is my project, uh, which I'm being helped with, with by a bunch of guys who work at Alios. Um, and we're using this, it started as a, a little idea where I was feeling really, really ill one day. Um, and I had a uh, quiver was blown up and I had loads of like code to review from external people. Um, like I'd wake up in the morning to like 15 pull requests because uh, it got really popular in China. And suddenly like everyone's submitting like pull requests um, overnight. I wake up in the morning, I was like 15 pull requests. I'm like, oh no, like I'm really feeling ill. I just took the morning off work. I was feeling ill. And I was like stood in the shower and I was like, why don't we get Quiver to review Quiver's code? It makes so much sense. Like Quiver's actually really, really good at um, finding like faults. As long as I'm very specific about the things I will reviewing, which I am, like because I have a review checklist anyway. For as long as I'm specific, then it could give me that information. So I uh, mocked out this really quick POC code review GPT, and it's kind of taken off a little bit. It was sort of like 700 stars in a few weeks, um, which is quite fine. It's like most of any project I've ever had. Um, and the idea is that we review code. It started out you can review it locally, but now we have um, mostly mostly people are using it in CI/CD like 3.4 thousand downloads a month which is like insane um for just like a little project that i mocked out uh and yeah we're like adding new features all the time we're adding a full back end on lambda so we'll have way more like uh customizability about prompts and things people will be able to um actually like vote whether they think the reviews are good or not but we'll talk about the reviews now we can do a little demo so I, I'm just going to run it locally because um, I don't want to like make PRs on like random repos. So <laughs> I'm actually going to show you one of the really cool, um, one of the really cool like functions of Quiver um, of uh, Code Review GPT. In that this is the code. Um, this is open. Yeah, perfect. 
this is like Quiver's code base. So it's like very straightforward. It started off as a, just an NPM package. Um, and we have like three commands. We have configure review test. Test is the stuff that we were chatting about or we're going to hopefully chat about in the future. Um, and that's like the non-deterministic end-to-end -end testing. Um, but let's, uh, we're, we're going to use the review functionality. Configure is to set up the, the tool in the CI, but we're just going to use the review functionality. And this is how we split it to make it like quite easy to work on. It's very functionally, um, very functionally uh, programmed. Other, there's one like caveat to that, other than the AI model, which is a class, because it fits in with Langchain's like object oriented, um, like uh, object oriented approach. So we have this Lang we have this class. Um, this class, pretty much all it does is instantiate this open AI, chat open AI, which is it comes from Langchain JS. And this is their adapter. You can think of it as like an SDK adapter um, to hit the chat open AI completions um, endpoint. That means I don't have to think about hitting endpoints. I don't have to think about really like using fetch or anything like that. I can just instantiate this class and they provide a bunch of helpful methods on this class. So um, there's like, you can look at the, you can look at the code, but actually quite a lot goes in to uh, getting a response back from an LLM. You have to think about when it's like, when it's stopping, when it's um, like how many tokens are being returned. You might want to like generate a report for how many tokens you're actually using, like the cost of each, um, of each thing. And you get this all out the box with Langchain. So I instantiate this class, I instantiate with a temperature, which is sort of like how crazy my model or how out of the box it's gonna go. Um, the model name, which uh, we prefer to use GPT-4, we just find it gets much better results and it's now in general availability, so anyone can use it. So it keeps it open and an API key. So users currently supply their own API keys. Um, this makes, it means we can like provide all this service for free. And as an NPM script, you just add your own API key to an M file or to the GitHub uh, runner, like in a secret or GitLab. Now we have GitLab support and it just, it just works. So uh, we call the model uh, literally just with this dot call method that comes from Langchain. And we've just added like a one line, a one line um, space here just to uh, make this file like staged change, give this file some stage changes. And then what we can do is do code review GPT. So I've installed the uh, NPM script globally with, um, with NPM I dash G code review GPT. I don't know if you can see my terminal. It's, I know it's kind yeah, of Yeah, I can see it. It's at the bottom. Awesome. Um, and then we just run code review GPT review. Um, in CI, you would just want to review, um, make the review type of change. So it only reviews change lines, but we're going to use review type full. And there's quite, there's a little bit of magic that goes into the back end to working out which lines to send to the, uh, to send to the LLM, which lines to summarize, which lines to get embeddings and how we like split it up and create the prompt. And that's kind of what this does. Like anyone could build this tool. Um, but it was, it was a way for us to experiment about all these different ways of adding to prompts. Um, so if we do code review um, type full, it will take the whole file or as much of it as it can in the context window of the model, which is um, 8,000 uh, tokens, basically 8,000 characters. Uh, so I think it should get this whole file. This file is not very long. It's only 71, 71 lines long. Um, and it will send the whole thing to the LM model and say, review this whole file. So this is like our most basic approach. So it takes sort of about a minute. So now we're going to have like a bit of minute of awkward conversation um, while, we, while we're waiting for this to work. Um, well, the error, error here is, this? yeah, so this error is not my error. Um, this error is Langchain tracing. So I can talk a little bit about what this means. So it's actually a very cool new tool that they're that they're bringing out and i was a beta tester so that's why it's taking that's why we're erring they're still fixing some stuff so um what that like that was actually really quick that came back very fast so what that what that lang chain error was we can just talk about that really quickly oh i'm going to show everyone my api keys now so don't worry this so I, I, I would add this and then uh, block it out awesome okay so in a dot m file that would be awesome if you could block it out i will change them at the end after this but that would be awesome um in this .m file, um, I define this uh, Langchain API key, and this uses their new LangSmith. So it's their new tool for tracking uh, calls to LLMs, and it's like observability for AI. Um, and it's really, really interesting. And we can go to uh, LangSmith. We can go to Smith um, .langchain. 
can have a look and we can see we can see the model this was the this was the run that just happened oh so, nice so it oh, actually no, you can see that you can see the prompt that gets sent to the model yeah that was a, that was actually a test case okay the run that just happened hasn't quite come through yet it's still a little bit buggy it's in like alpha um but it gives me like how many runs i've run locally how many tokens i've spent and um, like latency and all like a bunch of useful things. And they're going to build it out even more in the future. And it, it's really useful. So this is what Les Lang Smith, and this is provided out the box with LangChain. All I need to do is set a bunch of process.m variables, which I've done here. Um, and it adds that tracing. So that fetches an error in handler. LangChain tracer is just an internal error on their side. Uh, fetch is not defined. So like you get that. Yeah. But it doesn't actually okay. cause any problems from our point of view. It's a bug in theirs. Okay. So, we can see if we go back to our code, you can stop, hopefully stop blowing this out. Um, we can see here that it's uh, it's gone to risk level five. So risk level five is like our top level risk and it's really worried about this file. And the reason why it's really worried about this file is like, it's not a really valid reason. So this will come on to what we're talking about later, but it says the API key is being stored in plain text within the AI model interface and is used in the constructor. This is true. This is a requirement from OpenAI that's used in the con uh, from Langchain that's used in this constructor like this. Um, so it's being used here. So this is a high risk practice as it exposes sensitive information. Considering using an environment variable to store sensitive information, so it is stored in it in in an environment variable. But what this review is telling me is that there's probably a better way for me to sub this in like this, and it's given me a risk level five because anything to do with secrets, any secrets that we're spotting. Um, it normally gives a risk level five. We tell it that you really should take that stuff seriously. Um, and so it's going to tell me a better way of doing it. I should actually just import it directly from process.m and I shouldn't pass it around in plain text. So if I implemented that, we'd be all sorted. I should, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, cool. So that was the little review here. Uh, if you go on to um, uh, Code of View GPT on GitHub, there is a there is a there is a video that we that I made, um, which basically I try and upload a bunch of bad code to a GitHub repo, and you can see how it works in CI, uh, which is quite nice. Essentially, I was trying to create like a Fibonacci sequence. I was also exposing environment environment key uh, like um, API keys, secret keys. Um, yeah, so I did a synchronous file write. Uh, input validation was all wrong. Uh, I was logging sensitive information and my code was written in JavaScript, but I should have been in TypeScript. And so it knew all this sort of stuff. And this is like, you can see, you can see if you want to have a look at some of the reviews, you can actually go to the repo. And this is, uh, this was three days ago. Um, you can see the review that happened on some of Manon's work. She's working on this code and we actually run it on itself in CI, which is quite fun. So it's lovely. You're doing your, you're eating your own dog food and uh, <laughs> yeah. that's cool. So it's very much inception. And we've kind of spotted two issues here. Um, so we spotted that it's use, it's it's uh, trying to find secret keys when secret keys, maybe I don't actually care about that particular problem that much. Um, and also here, it's done the same thing twice. It said error handling could be improved, error handling can be improved. These are like the two problems actually that we're finding with COVID GPT that we're working on a fix for. Uh, and this fix involves moving um, out of the NPM script into Lambda and into S3 and into Dynamo, where we can actually store data. So we need to have we need to have data that um, can be retained between runs, so we can actually update users' prompts. So I want I want to be able to um, soon, like literally next week, I want to be able to uh, quote a reply on this and give it like a like a like a thumbs down. Or like a thumb, yeah, like a thumbs down, and be like, if you have like um, said the same thing twice, and then what I want it to be able to do is go back, evaluate that run, and maybe change the prompt. And I want all of this to be automatic. This is like my dream for AI dev tools. So you have automatic, you have automatic code of use, you have testing that runs because we made code of views, we needed to have run tests on our code of views. So we ran tests 
to check that it's always picking up on things that we wanted. And then I also want it to be able to update itself. So I want like a prompt engineering hypervisor to sit or process manager to sit on top of this stuff. And so because of this, uh, I know I'm rambling on a little bit, but we've created this Orion tools, which these are like four empty or three empty repositories and then the web app. And these, these are the things that I want to build. I think will really impact um, AI dev tooling for the better. And the first one is the prompt manager. So a one-line service, which just continuously refines your prompts. It takes in what you, um, your inputs, it takes in your outputs and it takes in feedback and it uh, passes that feedback into like a measurable change to the prompt. And then it continues this feedback loop. And I want this to be running on all my services. So that's number one. If anyone else wants to beat me to building this, please do, it will make everyone's life a lot easier. Um, that's the one thing we're doing. The second thing, is like a junior developer powered by AI, it writes 80% of your code, it opens a draft PR, and then you just have to do that fiddling on the top. You just have to like, um, you just have to like check that it's like basically run your code review. And we've got a tool for that as well. So this is what we kind of want to build. We want to like connect this feedback loop with AI with all these individual tools that we can adapt um, and optimize as well as they can be optimized. So this junior developer, you would uh, create something like, I'm thinking of something like a GitHub issue, and you would create this issue like with like really, really high levels of detail. It would, because it, LLM needs a high levels of detail, it can't really infer very much. You'd be like, in this file, make this. In this file, make this. This is how you're going to connect them up. Then it would just submit, uh, it would go away 15 minutes or something, it would come back. Um, and it would have created this draft PR that you can work on top of. So that's one plan. My next plan, which we've already done, which is the testing. So do we want to talk about testing? Yeah, because uh, I guess with uh, generative AI, one of the problems is the fact that it's the inter well, it's it's not deterministic. Every time you ask a question, you may get a different answer. So uh, I remember you wrote about it recently about the, how you sort of address this uh, this problem. So yeah. do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it wasn't me who wrote this. It was um, it was uh, another developer, Alios, uh, called Fabian, and he wrote an awesome article about how we address this problem in Code Review GPT. Um, and you can find that article at the genaidays.org forward slash blog. It's a collective that I'm part of, um, which is just all about like building with generative AI, and we run meetups in London and Paris and New York, and we're going to have a global conference. Once a year, I think the the timeline for that is January. So um, yeah, if you're interested, definitely go check out JI Days and go check out the Fabian's blog here, where he goes into huge amounts of detail about how there's a huge need for testing prompts and how there is no tool to deal with testing prompts and how we solve that problem. Um, and if you spotted earlier, you'd have seen this test results summary. And these are our, these are our tests running in CI. Um, these are end-to-end -end tests, testing non-deterministic code. What I mean by that is you provide the same response to, or the same um, prompt to an LLM. It will return you, it's not guaranteed to return you the same thing every time. It will return you almost the same thing, but not the same thing. There might be a comma in a different place. They might have used a different word. Like there, it will be almost the same. So how do we solve this problem? Well, it's actually really, really interesting. So what we did was you can have a look at all the code. Currently, the code is still in the code of your GPT repo, but I'll be moving it out into that GP test repo and we'll be making uh, more of a generic testing tool. I'm thinking something like custom assertions that go with Jest and they'll be compatible with Vitest. Something like, um, yeah, something like, well, you can see what you do here. It's going to be very clear what it, what it does. So we create a bunch of test cases. So in this case, we just wrote, write them out in natural language. LLMs work with natural language. We can't be bothered to write like huge long test case files. So we're just gonna write them out in natural language. LLMs are very good at making uh, code from examples. So we say bad variable names. We want a code snippet with a bad variable name. And what that does is it's gonna create this code snippet with this bad variable name. So these are like really bad variable names. There's, you've got an underscore, you've got a number. Um, it's like it's like not great for JavaScript. Um, and then we've got a bad function, which is taking these bad variable names and returning them. I didn't ask for that, but LLMs, they do what they want. Um, and then what I do is I have this example output, this example snapshot. So 
this example snapshot is like a risk level that we associate with the bad with the bad variable names and a bunch of reasons why those variable names are bad. They can't start with numbers. We shouldn't use special characters. They should be following a camel case convention for TypeScript. These are like the things that we want to look for. And then what we do is we do, we talk about the embeddings earlier. We do this like, we get embeddings of this and we get embeddings of the test case that comes through the, the tool. And then we do, well, not this. We get embeddings of this and we get embeddings of um, what the tool outputs when we put this into it. Um, and then we do like a semantic search um, between those two embeddings and we work out how similar they are. And if they're um, within like 90, if they're within 10%, so we have this like threshold, they're within 10%, we consider that a pass. If they're within 20%, we, we monitor it as a warn. And if they're outside of that range, uh, we fail the test and that would fail the CI. The idea being that this is not like a one-stop shop, like humans will still have to look if they see anything with a warn status. And the warn is like, they've really changed the structure. Maybe your model has changed slightly on, their, on the back end. We don't control these models. So maybe they've changed the model. Um, and like the pass obviously is good. And if it fails, it's like likely that your underlying implementation is broken. Like maybe your prompt has changed or something is, a, is your problem at that point. So this was like, we felt like this was a necessity to start building with LLMs. We felt like... Uh, that this didn't exist and we had to build it before we could have any confidence in our outputs. So we built it and uh, we're gonna make it a custom tool. Um, there's so many things to do in this. If someone wants to get started, I'd love to contribute. Um, but yeah, otherwise we're gonna bring that out and we're gonna make that our own custom tool. Um, it's gonna be open source, anyone can use it. All good fun. Okay, and uh, you said that this framework is already available on the GitHub repo you showed me earlier uh, as part of the Orion tools, right? Yeah, so Orion tools is like our brand new sort of collective of uh, tools that we're going to build. None of these tools are finished. They're all very much in alpha, um, like even more so than CodeView GPT. Nothing works properly yet. But hopefully sort of by the end of this week, I'll have moved uh, the testing tools. So it should be by the time that this has been released, I should move the testing tools into GP test. So you can try the assertions for yourselves if you are building with LLMs. And then it will probably be like a month or so by the time we have these prompt managers or these junior GPT ready for anyone to test. But I would love like anyone to try and test it and see what they think. I think they're going to be really powerful things for the future. Yeah, I really like the testing approach. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the so whole property-based testing uh, and the things like uh, Quick Check for uh, Haskell and Erlang, where you kind of just write the spec as opposed to the specific input and output that you're looking for. So you you, you kind of let the framework generate those um, uh, inputs and you check the property of the output uh, as opposed to the actual the exact content, which is kind of sim which very similar to I guess the uh, uh, what you are doing here with the with, with the testing approach that you've adopted. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, exactly. Uh, we sort of thought about it like snapshot testing, like non-deterministic snapshot testing, so threshold snapshot testing, but exactly, yeah. I never thought of it like that. We are 100% um, right, getting it right to write a spec and then uh, checking the property at the other end. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to be really, really interesting um, there's going to be so many people writing prompts and they don't know what their prompts actually do. And relying on user feedback to, to tell you what your prompts do just feels ridiculous for an app that you want to push to production. Okay. So I guess uh, talking about development, um, so you've, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, some of the things that this project you've done and we've kind of seen a bit of the code behind for code review GPT. Um, so what would you say is the current state of uh, LangChain development and how would someone try to get started if uh, this is something that they want to sort of go into? So first things first would be to have a look at the documentation. Uh, Landshare has done a lot of work recently. They've been kind of criticized for having quite difficult docs, um, but they've done a lot of work recently on actually building the documentation out, making it much more useful. They have examples now, um, like literally walkthroughs. They have, um, I think they have something called a cookbook, which is a Jupyter notebook with um, all these different things of how you can make stuff, how you can get started. Yeah, answering questions using sources. This is exactly the implementation of Quiver, pretty much it was the initial implementation of Quiver. Um, 
And this is a great way to get started. Build your own mini app, you know, like this stuff is not that complicated. We can see an example of this being like one of the projects that has had like a huge amount of usage um, and got like a lot of popularity was a project called Private GPT. Um, and this is made by a guy called Ivan. I, and he's like super, super nice. Um, and he made this um, a few months ago. It's we're on like 30, 35,000 stars. It's crazy. But if you actually look at what uh, private GPT is, wherever the, um, the, the Python file is, is the main file is 83 lines of code, of which 10 of them is passing arguments. And five, and then a bunch more of them is just printing logs. So like the actual code involved in this is quite small, but the understanding of what's going on in the back end, um, uh, like inside Langchain internally is more complicated. Um, and that's what I would recommend looking at, but definitely try make something um, is you can use uh, like Google Colab notebooks. Like you can use Google Colab and like, you can get started. I have no idea what this is going to open. Um, and it's like very straightforward for getting started running Python. You can run it line by line um, in your browser. You don't have to install anything. I really would recommend just have a go, um, follow some tutorials, read about some stuff and use like tools that are on the market, like ChatGPT, um, like CodeView GPT, like Quiver, just have a go with them. And you'll very quickly understand what LLMs are good at and what LLMs are not so good at. And um yeah, I think it's I think it's a super exciting time. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, the whole AI hype has just been pretty crazy. You can't go anywhere without seeing ten different conversations or ads about AI. And it's something that I've been kind of loosely looking into myself as well. I've been using a lot of the AI tools uh, like ChatGPT and Midjourney for the stuff that I'm doing. Um, still have. Um, I guess question marks about the uh, accuracy of uh, ChatGPT doing coding. Uh, you know, a lot of things I've tried to do, it doesn't quite get there in terms of uh, the output I'm looking for. Uh, but it's, you know, in, in terms of the actual the, the sort of the space and where it's going, how quickly it's going as well, it's pretty crazy. So I guess we're coming up to the hour, uh, and I'm really, uh, really impressed by the things that you've shown me so far. Um, you said before we go, is there anything that you'd like to also just you know, talk about? Anything that you want to share? Uh, perhaps there are job openings that uh, are yours, people you know, that you know, for people who want to work on this stuff and learn more about line chain and and and, and how do you serve as technologies uh, working with AI? Yeah. So I guess one thing that'd be really good to shout out is. Um, so Quiver is open source. All these tools that I've talked about are open source. Langchain is open source. Um, if we go to code of GPT is open source. All this stuff you can contribute to. Um, and it's I really want to like lower the barrier of entry for people contributing to this stuff. Um, it's not it's not fiendishly complicated. Once you build yourself your own little app, you'll work out what we're doing very, very quickly. Um, if you're into Python, have a look at Quiver. If you're into Code GPT, if you're into TypeScript, have a look at Code GPT. And like, just get involved in the community. Qu um, Stan has managed to build up quite a large community on Discord um, to do with Quiver, and they all answer each other's questions about like um, what functionality each other are adding. And um, I would really like get involved. It's a community thing, and open source is really leading the way here. Um, and we're really like fighting the bigger players uh, like OpenAI and even like Microsoft and to some extent like AWS. Um, we're really like like making something of our own here. They're gonna build wonderful foundational models, but we're gonna use them to create really cool UX, really cool developer experience. Um, and that's what, that's what people should be wanting to get involved in. Um, we have, I'd love to shout out uh, um, Gen AI Days. We ran a meetup last week in London. It was the first one we've done in London. There was like a hundred and uh, uh, yeah, 150 people there or something ridiculous. It was crazy. It was such good fun. Um, and yeah, I really like, it was super good. We're going to run another one in like sort of three weeks time. There's a meetup page. They're also running them in Paris and in New York. So if you're interested in Genetive AI, definitely have a look at Gen AI Day's events. Um, come along to that. Um, I'm speaking at the AWS user group. It will be, it's it's on Wednesday, so it'll be after this is published, but I'm sure there'll be a video um, out about that. And uh, yeah, 
every open source project you like the look of, um, whether it's like whatever I'm working on or like anything else, I would just implore you to give it a star. If you have a GitHub account, it helps these guys making these projects like be able to carry on doing it. It helps them raise funds. It helps them justify to people that they're useful. So yeah, please give like stars willingly and often. And um, yeah, I hope to see some of you at a conference sometime. Great. And uh, I'll put all of those links uh, into the description below as well. So anyone who wants to come to the meetup or to check out any of the open source projects that uh, we've seen today, uh, you can find them in the description below. So yeah, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you next time when I'm in London. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I hope someone learned something out of this. And uh, yeah, feel free to contact me or Jan and he can forward you on to me or anyone else. We're all very approachable um, and we'd love to see more people getting involved. Yeah, I will put the Matt's uh, contact detail as well as Alio's uh, contact detail down below as well. So feel free to check those guys out and uh, come to the next uh, serverless uh, London meetup as well, which uh, I guess is going to be in a few weeks' time. Yeah, the next serverless London one is at Motorway. I think it's the 30th of um, 30th of August, and that will be really, really good fun as well. Yeah, we have okay. double meetups going on now. Sounds so good. good. <laughs> yeah, Gen GI, Gen GI, uh, Gen, Gen AI, and the Serverless London. So you guys are pretty busy. Today. They work really well together. They work really well together. It's good. Cool. All right, man. In that, in that case, uh, thank you everyone for listening today or watching today, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Okay, bye bye. Thanks. Bye.